just give everyone a few more minutes to join us. So welcome everyone to day two of our energy conference, which is happening every day this week, celebrating World Consumer Rights Day. So this session is about shaping the next generation of consumer centred business models in energy. And um, so just some house rules, if you can, please remain on mute when you're not speaking so that everyone can hear the panellists and um, you will have the chat function activated. So if you think of any questions or even if you just want to introduce yourself at the moment, you can do that. Um, so for interpretation, we do have um, French and Spanish available. So if you click the interpretation button, um, it's circled in red in this little diagram um, and choose your speaking language. And if you do have any issues with that, again, just pop it in the chat. Um, so we also have closed captions. Um, so again, you click the show captions button at the bottom, which is in this little red box, and choose your speaking language. And now I'm going to pass over to Rocio, who is our moderator for today's panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today. I'm Rocio Concha. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy, at which which is an independent consumer group uh, here in the UK. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you and a brilliant group of uh, panelists in the second day of the Consumer International Clean Energy Conference. And if you join us uh, yesterday, you will know that the 200 uh, uh, member organizations of Consumer International, including which, has voted that for this year, World Consumer Rights Day, we wanted to focus on the, on the how we empower consumers in the transition to clean energy. Now, the focus of today is about business models that can really transform the way that consumers engage and participate in the energy transition. And I want to give you two brief examples. So as you know, in our way to uh, net zero, we need to decarbonize our electricity uh, generation. And that means that we need to move from fossil fuel to renewable electricity. That means wind, uh, solar, hydro, uh, biomass. Now, some of this um, uh, electricity generation is intermittent, is variable. We cannot really control when the sun is out there, at which we could, and we will have a much pleasant uh, uh, life here in the UK, but we can. So at the same time that we are getting this uh, more intermittent generation, we as a consumers are trying to find a way to reduce our carbon footprint at home. We are introducing energy efficiency measures, but we also are substituting our uh, gas heating with heat pumps, moving away from petrol cars to electric vehicles. And all that means that we are reducing our carbon footprint, but also increasing our uh, electricity demand. If we leave the system as it is and just focus on some energy efficiency measures, we will have to put quite a lot more generation, quite a lot more capacity in the network that take that generation to our homes to deal with that increased uh, demand in electricity, uh, in electricity demand. Now, the good news is that many of these uh, energy appliances that we are uh, putting in our homes can be a very useful source of flexibility that can be used to reduce the system cost of network, increasing the capacity of the network, the generation capacity, and therefore reduce our energy bills. And today we are going to hear from uh, some of our panelists that are putting or developing this uh, business that will help us to make that transition. Now, it's also important that we don't exclude any consumer groups for engaging in this energy transition. 
And the good news is that there are also very interesting business models emerging in some countries that will help with that. Um, today, we will uh, hear from, for example, pay as you go uh, in solar. So now let me let me uh, introduce the panel. The, the focus of today, is just to remind ourselves, is to make sure that we understand the opportunity of this business model, how we make sure that the consumer is at the center of those services, and as a part of that, what are the protections that we need to put in place so consumers really trust these new services and therefore engage with them in an effective manner. So let me introduce the panel. We have Kristen Panerali. She is the head of clean power and electrification at the World Economic Forum. And there, Kristen focuses on working with businesses, government, civil society to accelerate the transition to clean energy. We also have uh, Marcia Poletti, who is the head of European System Change at Octopus Energy. Octopus Energy is a renewable energy group specializing on, uh, in sustainable energy. And in there, Marcia focuses on driving change to deliver the energy transition as quickly, as cheaply as possible. We also have Mark Hamilton. Mark is the managing director of Flexi Grid. And Flexi Grid is an aggregation platform designed to unlock the value of a small scale behind the behind uh, the meter flexibility. Then we have Jesus Lemasagari, who is a senior market engagement manager at GSMA. GSMA is a global member organization representing the mobile industry. And in there, Lima focuses on partnership on digital solutions, improving the provision of utility service. So as you can see, we have a brilliant group of panelists. Now, Christine, can you start us with uh, explaining uh, the need for smart and efficient electrification at a scale? Over to you, Christine. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm going to really focus on the, the big picture of the energy transition and how electrification fits into it. So I think we all know that the energy transition is complex. And the North Star is really about addressing these different and sometimes they're, they're competing dimensions of what we call the energy triangle. And so the way that we define those dimensions are energy security and resilience, sustainability and climate impact, and then third, an affordable and just system. Yet today we have economies and businesses and households that are experiencing a, a triple crisis of not only energy security and affordability, but also the impacts of climate change. And I think we all know that the energy crisis and, and climate change are really closely connected. And, and it's the supply and the use of energy that is producing more than two thirds of global greenhouse gases today. So change is needed not only on the supply side, but also on how we consume energy, especially in industry and transportation and buildings. And so today we're talking about smart and efficient electrification. And, and I want to highlight three areas of acceleration, three opportunities that we're focused on here at the World Economic Forum. So first of all, electrifying everything that can be electrified. Second, unlocking the power of the demand side. The, when I talk about demand side, I'm talking about the way we consume energy. And then thirdly, raising the game on clean power. So we often talk about, you know, there, there's all sorts of electrify everything types of movements. And, and our, our take on that is to electrify everything that can be electrified. So right now, the global economy is running on about 20% electricity. And not all of that's clean electricity. And everything else is powered by fossil fuels. But now we know that all of the different scenarios out there, whether it's the International Energy Agency or IRENA, all of those are showing that the final energy demand must increase from this 20% to 30% by 2030 and to 50% plus by 2050. 
And that's a radical change. And practically speaking, what that means is that cars and buildings and industries need to move to clean electricity that's backed by renewable sources. And when this happens, it can really make a large impact on global emissions. Up to 70% of global emissions can, can be eliminated. And, and this is because these technologies like heat pumps, they're using one third the energy of natural gas furnace. And, and even on the, the, the supply side, the clean electricity itself is eliminating half to two thirds of the energy that's normally lost in waste heat when you're using coal or natural gas. So there's this overall massive efficiency that's created by switching to electrification. So not only is it cost competitive, but it's also really going to be key to decarbonizing so many different sectors of the economy, especially looking at road transport and building heating and certain certain processes in industrial sectors. So low temperature and medium temperature types of processes. So the second point I wanted to make was that, that we really need to be focusing on, um, you know, to, to, to meet all of the above, right? We need to raise the game on clean power and really deliver massive capacity expansion. So clean power, we're talking about Anything that's that's you know not generating emissions. So I'm really focused on on the renewable side here, and that clean power has to triple by 2030, and it has to increase ninefold by 2050. Now, some of this is going to be on the grid, and some of this is going to be decentralized energy resources. So decentralized clean power and batteries that can be deployed across all different types of consumption, from residential to to industrial. And then the third point I wanted to make is that there's a real need to unlock the power of the demand side of the equation. So often we're really focused on renewables and the supply side and increasing um, you know, renewables in order to enable the energy transition. And, and more and more, we're seeing that the consumption side is really the the new opportunity so industrial and commercial and residential consumption that demand side of the equation needs to work as hard as the supply side to deliver more efficiency a flexible system and more resilience and and decarbonize so there's there's various ways that that can happen one is is just by reducing waste thinking about you know, much more systemic efficiency, like, you know, amp companies like Amazon are using waste heat to pumping it into district heating um, systems. Then you've got um, opportunities for, for just more traditional energy efficiency. So, so insulation or, or looking at um, of other types of, of installations in, in the home in order to cr increase efficiency or in industry using digitalization in order to create that efficiency. And then, and then finally, I think that there's a real opportunity to unlock the demand side by, by you know, really following the wind and the sun as much as possible. So looking at some of these 24-7 you know, carbon-free um, data centers and or participating in demand response types of programs and smart charging, I think digital can really play a big role in unlocking the demand side and making it far more impactful in this transition. And, and I think the prize can really be significant. In the IEA net zero scenarios, thanks to electrification and energy efficiency and even behavioral changes, total energy supply can decline by 10% between up to, up to 2030. But that's happening at the same time that the global economy is growing by a third. So you're having the whole energy system is, is somewhat shrinking because it's becoming more efficient because of electrification, yet the economy is still growing. So at the forum, we're focused on driving these changes. We work closely with a range of stakeholders, including business and government and, and civil society. And we're working on mobilizing 
coalition and mobilizing more action. And, and we connect stakeholders with the different frameworks, with the policies, with the business models and innovations that are working so that we can foster a, a much broader global exchange on the insights and tools that can really make a difference. We're really grateful to be here and a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Kristen. Um, very clear articulation of the uh, size of the challenge, but also the opportunity. So now moving on to the opportunity of the, of the power of the demand, Marsha, over to you so you can give us the supplier perspective to this debate. Thank you, Rocio, and thank you, Kristen. Uh, they were both great speeches around um, that really large scale picture. Um, and what I'd like to do now is look at it from a, the point of view of an individual consumer. So as a way of introduction, um, at Octopus Energy, our vision is to drive the green transition more quickly and more cheaply for consumers. And I think when Kristen was talking about the need to introduce huge amounts of renewable energy onto the system, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, 50% of energy use by 2050 being electricity and the principle of electrifying energy, the only way we can do that cheaply is by putting consumers at the heart and using and leveraging the flexibility that consumers can provide. And what do I mean by that? Well, we are electrifying heat in the form of heat pumps or uh, storage heaters. We have electric vehicles. We have air conditioning. Um, we've got solo, solar photovoltaic systems uh, and we have batteries. Um, and all of these devices have some measure of flexibility or can interact with the system in a flexible manner. Um, We've, we're moving from a world where we had historically uh, either very flat energy tariffs or peak and off peak. Uh, and that was partly driven because our generators were very stable and we could match the electricity produced with the way consumers demanded. We're now moving to a much more dynamic world where the wind is blowing or the sun is shining and we want to use that energy. And so what does it take? Well, it requires new business models and it requires new ways of interacting with these energy smart appliances. So these devices like the EV or the air conditioning unit or your thermostat um, and being able to steer those. Uh, and there is huge value in that. Um, and why? Because currently, when demand increases, we generally start using gas-fired power stations. And right now, that's very expensive. And But it's also, in the long run, much more expensive than renewable energy. And so what we want to be doing is moving demand to periods of time when uh, the prices are cheap and when they're green. Um, and so the new business models that we are talking about all involve uh, giving consumers the choice on how they, uh, who they would like to allow to steer their devices and getting consumers to give or to describe their preferences and ensuring that consumers can always change their mind because we all live in a world where someone unexpected turns up like my grandmother and I want to make sure the house is warm for her or I need to do a long trip so I need I want my car charged so we as suppliers need to be respectful of what consumers their, their lives and the complexity they live um, we need to recognize the value that they are providing to the energy system and give them that value back again um, and we need to uh, do it in such a way that it fits their lifestyles. Um, and I think part of this is around, and the way, so there is a lot of complexity there. 
we are talking directly to uh, to the electric vehicle or to the heat pump, and um, so these these devices are often uh, controlled uh, virtually in the cloud, and so we are integrating with all of these devices. But that complexity is not something which needs to be translated into the consumer's experience. And so if we are to mobilize the consumer's flexibility, it needs to be simple. Um, so it's easy for consumers to both uh, sign up, so to include their car or their heat pump. Uh, it needs to be the value proposition, what consumers are getting needs to be transparent and very clear. Um, and I, I have I have huge faith um, that that we will get there. Um, that uh, consumers' flexibility and their desire to participate is there. I think it's really important that we use that we allow markets and we allow competition to uh, ensure that consumers do get this value. Uh, so I think in many electricity systems, the uh, often the engineers who are running these systems are not that uh, are reluctant to let consumers in the door. And I think one of the things that will need to change is engineers will need to understand that consumers have a lot to offer. Um, I failed miserably to check the time when I started. Uh, so I think I'm probably out of time. Um, but I look forward to the discussion uh, that we'll be having amongst the panelists. Uh, and I, I really look forward to watching this energy transition because it is happening and it is happening now. We are controlling we are controlling grid scale sized resources in the UK. So we are able to provide significant support to the energy system alongside delivering value for consumers. And I, you know, it's not the future, it is now. Thank you, thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you, Marsha. And I love the way that you articulate how important it is that the consumer is part of the development of these uh, uh, business, uh, new business models. Now let's move to Mark. Mark, can you give us the perspective from the aggregator and how these digital platforms can enable a greater participation from consumers in the, um, providing that flexibility? Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Rohio. Um, yeah, so Mark Hamilton, Managing Director of the FlexiGrid team at SMS PLC. And yeah, I think it's a good follow on from um, Marcia's uh, overview on, on this from the energy supplier perspective. But as she noted, there is um, uh, competition uh, is, is, is a healthy thing. And, and uh, we bring um, a, a perspective from an independent aggregator point of view as to how we view the future. Um, I fully agree with everything the other panelists have said on the need for flexibility in the system. I think the question is, how do we uh, encourage and incentivize consumers to bring their flexibility uh, into the system and how do we reward them? Uh, and how does that benefit the overall energy system as a whole? So I'm going to use a few visual references to talk through uh, flexibility. Hopefully that will help people to visualize what um, what flexibility actually is. So uh, if we go on to the next slide, I'll just do a, a quick overview on, on grid balancing and what, what it's all about. So showing here is just a, a typical month on the UK electricity grid. Uh, this is from a few years ago now, but similar kind of patterns um, uh, in, in, in different months between, between summer and winter. Uh, so this is kind of a end of the summer period. Um, on the top, you'll see electricity demand varying in the very kind of repeatable pattern that it, that it follows with very low usage at nighttime, uh, increase in demand during the morning, um, leveling off during the afternoon peak and then a, uh, sorry, leveling off during the afternoon and then a, a, an evening peak. So this happens day in, day out. The job of, of electricity uh, grid operator is to balance supply and demand. So they need to ensure that the amount of generation feeding into the grid is exactly the same as the amount of demand coming off the grid uh, every second of the day, otherwise uh, the grid is at risk of, of going down. Now, at the moment, uh, or at least a few years ago, uh, during this month, we had wind and solar uh, generation feeding in, as you see in the, the, the green line below. So you see a kind of baseline of wind generation with uh, solar peaks coming in day in, day out. So 
that's renewable sources like wind and solar are providing a meaningful contribution towards overall electricity demand or overall electricity generation requirements, but there's still a shortfall. So uh, if you go on to the next slide, um, in between renewable generation and the overall demand level, at the moment we're using fossil fuels to do balancing for us. So um, controllable fossil fuel generation is able to relatively quickly respond to uh, demand or generation fluctuations and fill the gaps in between uh, renewables and overall demand levels. So that's how we're managing the system at the moment. Now, if we look forward 10, 20 years from now, um, I think it was uh, Kristen earlier that mentioned the, the, the amount of new renewable generation that needs to come onto the system to fully decarbonize. If we multiply existing levels of renewable generation on the UK grid by around a factor of four, then within a, a given month, we'll produce enough overall uh, energy uh, to meet uh, demand levels. But it, it's not as simple as that. So if you go on to the next slide, so this is kind of fast forwarding into the future. If you multiply existing wind and solar resources by four, uh, then the amount of area under the, the green curve is sufficient to meet the amount of area under the under the demand curve, but we have very significant peaks and troughs between uh, supply and demand. So the system will just not work uh, if um, we just continue putting lots of renewable generation on and not addressing the intermittency problem. So this is where flexibility comes in. We need flexibility to, to, to balance supply and demand. Um, and if we use that flexibility, which is coming from the demand side of the grid, then we'll start to be able to shape uh, electricity demand to follow the intermittency of renewables. So if you go on to the next slide, it just gives an idea of, of the kind of level of demand uh, flexibility that, um, that will be needed that we can use to start more closely following the intermittency of, of renewable generation. So hopefully that's a helpful kind of visual aid to understanding the, the need for flexibility. Now the question is, where does that flexibility come from? If you go on to the next slide, so we can look to the kind of supply side of the grid um, or the demand side of the grid for, for this flexibility. We can also look to kind of in between. So uh, large uh, pumped hydro, for example, has always been used to help balance the grid. We're now seeing a massive increase in the levels of front of meter uh, battery storage coming onto the, UK, onto the UK grid and elsewhere, which can help to provide that balance. Um, we really focus, our FlexiGrid platform has been developed entirely to focus on behind the meter uh, flexibility. So unlocking the value of um, potentially millions of small scale assets um, behind the meter flexibility assets like EV charging, battery systems, flexible electric heating, uh, pulling these all together to act as a, as a virtual power plant to help, um, to help bring that flexibility into to manage renewable intermittency. Um, next slide. So, what's the big deal around behind the meter, I guess? So, you know, how much of it is there? How much of it is there going to be in the future? So uh, on the left, you see uh, at the moment, the kind of overall levels of um, flexibility that we currently have on the UK grid. Remembering that the UK system is something around a kind of 60 gigawatt system, depending on, on the season. But so we do have a lot of uh, storage heating, for example. Uh, electrical uh, storage heating is quite prevalent in the UK, primarily comes on during the, uh, the nighttime hours. There's about 10 gigawatts of that on the system at the moment, which is um, a lot of flexibility that uh, isn't really being used as effectively as it could be at the moment. EV charging is starting to, to feature very significantly. We've got now got somewhere around three, four, five gigawatts worth of EV charging, both domestic and public charging. So they're starting to ramp up. Heat pumps at the moment aren't uh, a huge feature, but will continue to grow. Domestic batteries are quite exciting, but uh, again, the levels of uh, capacity on the grid at the moment aren't very significant. Now, if you look forward, if you click again, let's go on to the next. If you look forward, um, this is crystal ball gazing stuff, right? So it's difficult to know, but we certainly expect very significant increases in the levels of capacity uh, of things like heat pumps, very much so EV charging. Uh, domestic batteries will start to, <coughs> to feature uh, quite a lot as well. So all of this electrification of heat and transport in particular could present significant uh, problems to the grid in terms of managing peak demand. But as Marcia, I think, mentioned earlier, uh, th these, uh, incre this increase in, in demand uh, capacities uh, can be a huge part of the solution. 
uh, to, the, to decarbonization. So if we use the capacities that are coming on uh, in terms of behind the meter, uh, smartly and intelligently and use uh, them to, to bring that flexibility to, to manage the intermittency problem, then it's a it's a win-win it's a for everybody. So uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of uh, what FlexiGrid uh, does, um, it's got a fancy animation here and I won't talk through all the text, but effectively it's a cloud-based aggregation platform which monitors and controls distributed energy assets like battery storage, uh, EV charging, um, and flexible electric heating systems. So we constantly monitor what's happening on the grid in terms of renewable uh, supply, uh, the weather forecasting, what's happening on the grid. Um, and then we start to understand what we need the demand side of the grid to do to be able to help the system while benefiting consumers. So put very simply, if the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, we want demand levels to increase to match as closely as possible those um, levels of renewable supply so we can use as much of it as possible. Uh, if we don't do this, then we're going to end up oversizing grids, uh, very expensive grids to manage peak demand and peak generation. We can have a much more efficient system if we understand uh, what's happening on the grid and look to the demand side to be responsive to that uh, intermittency. Uh, next slide. Just a closing slide on the kind of, again, visualization point of view. So in any aggregation platform sits kind of in between the markets and the grids and uh, the end consumer. So our platform constantly monitors both the market side and the consumer side and sends instructions basically across the assets which are operating as a virtual power plant uh, to behave in such a way so as to benefit the consumer first and foremost, um, while also benefiting the overall energy system in terms of, of efficient operation. I think in the panel session, I look forward to talking a bit more about the different ways to bring customers into these markets. I think I uh, fully agree with the, the previous panelists when they said about uh, the need for simplicity. Absolutely needed. This can all be quite confusing for our consumers and ultimately for the mass market consumers if we're going to move beyond the kind of early adopter or innovator market segment to kind of really understand energy. And if we want to make all this mass market, it really does need to be simple for the consumer uh, in terms of uh, participating. Uh, in grid service delivery and understanding the incentives that can uh, that can accrue to them. So, look forward to talking about it about that, all that in the uh, panel session. But I'll leave it there just now. I think that my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Another brilliant articulation about the size of the opportunity, isn't it, for this uh, flexibility in the demand and the technology that we already have to make that happen. Now, let's move uh, to Lima on focusing on a different business model, uh, Lima. Over to you to explain how digitalization and mobile system are transforming energy utilities in the developing countries. Over to you, Lima. Thank you, Rocio. Thank you, everyone else. Uh, glad to be here. Um, just uh, to say a little bit about um, the program that I work in at the GSMA. Um, it's called the Digital Utilities Program, and it supports urban resilience in low and uh, middle income countries. Uh, by enabling essential urban services through uh, digital tools and innovative partnerships. So we work in the sectors of energy, water, sanitation, waste management, and transport. Um, so basically, as has been highlighted, you know, the gap, the, the access gap for energy in emerging markets is, is quite huge, uh, particularly in rural areas where the national grid, you know, does not reach um, um, a lot of the households. And even if it reaches, you know, other issues, for example, affordability and reliability, you know, are, are prevalent. Um, but not just rural areas, even in urban areas, um, you know, due to rapid urbanization uh, caused by climate change and other factors, you know, there is a growth of uh, many informal settlements, which are often cut off from the grid. Um, and therefore, particularly low income households that live in this informal um, uh, uh, areas, you know, um, are affected by unreliable energy access. Um, off-grid solar or off-grid energy has been identified as the least cost electrification option for about 41% of those without power. So this is quite central to meeting SDG 7 targets. Uh, over the last 10 years, uh, GSMA through innovation funding uh, to startups um, in both, you know, rural communities and urban areas, um, you know, 
has been instrumental in trialing new business models um, you know, through uh, off-grid uh, electrification and digital solutions. Um, the most significant of this has been uh, innovations in uh, uh, pay-as-you-go solar. And uh, for those who don't know pay-as-you-go solar, uh, basically uh, it was uh, enabled uh, primarily by two innovations, a product innovation through um, a locking technology, uh, so remote locking technology of the solar device, and also through um, the introduction and growth of mobile money um, across different countries. So mobile money enabled um, you know, solar companies to collect uh, money remotely from, from consumers. And the locking technology enabled them you know, to manage the risk, uh, loan risk uh, of customers that are often quite low income and unbanked. Um, so those are two primary uh, innovations that enable the industry to grow, uh, not just that, but also the enabling environment you know, created by different governments uh, in the off-grid energy solar sector, um, you know, enabled uh, the sector to grow from a handful of uh, companies 10 years ago, you know, to a huge uh, industry that currently supports um, a lot of households and has bridged um, you know, uh, energy access uh, in, in, the, in, in low and middle income countries. Um, so also just touching on, uh, you know, on, on, on grid urban utilities, and I'm happy to expound more later in the panel, uh, but basically this decentralization um, through off-grid solar has also enabled them to focus on core areas of their business in urban areas. Uh, you know, improve efficiency and collect uh, revenue, more revenue from, um, you know, this segment of customers um, and basically allow these new innovators, you know, to focus on huge populations uh, that live in uh, uh, rural areas and also peri-urban areas. Um, as we go forward, you know, the sector has grown and has expanded uh, into not just lighting, but has enabled customers to uh, to become financially included, um, uh, basically, you know, have credit histories and are able to acquire newer products. So expanding from lighting, you know, to entertainment, to other life-changing products um, like uh, solar cooling, um, electric pumps for irrigation, and um, basically other products that allow, uh, you know, SMEs to, to thrive. Um, and 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 there is more that uh, you know we look forward to uh, in the sector as it becomes pay go everything and not just pay go you know lighting and 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 and, and simple uh, other uh, aspects. So um, uh, as we go forward as well, you know when you look at uh, on grid utilities in in urban areas, um, the role of smart metering and data analytics is becoming quite central to support them to become more efficient, you know, monitor the grid for inefficiencies and also, you know, provide better customer service um, and basically just balance, uh, you know, supply and demand. And the new, newer generation of urban innovators, you know, particularly, for example, in countries like Nigeria, you know, Pakistan, among others, who are supporting utilities to make this energy transition. I think also quite important to mention, you know, other innovators like um, many grid developers who are not just in rural areas supporting rural communities, but are also, uh, you know, closing the gap uh, in urban areas uh, where, you know, the national grids are able, uh, not able to, to serve. So the role of uh, metering in uh, their planning um, and also identifying, you know, new customers and control um, energy, uh, you know, consumption, is quite quite central. So I look forward to expound more on these aspects during the panel discussion. Otherwise, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Lima. Very interesting how much this model have grown um, and the opportunity to expand, as you say, to other areas. So um, let's move a little bit to the discussion. And I think that it is quite clear that there is huge opportunities in these business models um, in making sure that Consumers are, we don't leave anyone behind, making sure that we minimize the cost of the transition. Now, I have a question for all of you, which is how we can really guarantee that this is a win for the three, you know, in three areas, for consumers, for the energy system, and 
obviously for the planet. How, what are the things that you think that we need to consider to make sure that this is, win, is a win for all these three areas? So let me start with you, Marcia. Just taking myself off mute. Um, so it's a great question. And I think, I think part of the answer lies ensuring that consumers themselves have rights, you know, and being very clear um, that they have the choice about who steers their device. Uh, they have the choice of a range of different providers who, uh, who compete to give them value. Um, and I think as part of that, there needs to be significant transparency. And what do I mean? Well, I mean both how, how green the product is. Uh, Rothio mentioned this idea of, or Kirsten, uh, on um, 20, matching 24 hour seven. So ensuring that every single half hour or hour is clearly supplying renewables. And if it's not, be clear about that. Um, so transparent in that, that manner, but also transparent in how much value that you're providing to a consumer. So I think that's that's one thing. I think there needs to be, um, I think we need to treat cons the consumer flexibility uh, in the same way that we treat other resources, i.e. if it can provide the same value with the same technical constraints, it should be paid uh, the grid operators or um, suppliers or anyone else should pay an equivalent price. Um, and I think that's that's pretty key going forward. Um, uh, yeah, I've got lots to say, but I'm sure other of my panel members will have a really interesting perspective on that. Yeah, and it will be good to explore later about whether you see a trade-off between Simplicity that you were, uh, you know, planning before, and giving the consumers transparency and choice. But let, let's wait for that. So, Mark, what, can can we get your perspective on this? Sure. Yeah, I, I think I'll just start by kind of reminding people that you know, the, the renewable generation <clears throat> is by far the cheapest source of of generation at, at this stage at at source. So, to put some numbers on it, uh, we're seeing wind. CFD or CFD's contract for difference is that a guaranteed price that the renewable generators, generators will get paid. Um, we're seeing contracts of the order of five, six pence per kilowatt hour um, in the UK at the moment, uh, even lower in some cases for offshore wind, which is really starting to grow. Uh, solar generation, similar levels, uh, even in the UK, much lower in places with, with higher solar resource. And this compares to the, the very high prices that we've seen from gas generation over the past uh, year or so in particular. We've seen a massive increase in the retail price of electricity in the UK over the, uh, the last few years due to the, uh, uh, primarily due to the, the Russia-Ukraine situation and uh, the very high prices of gas that are driving uh, price increases up for electricity supply uh, in Europe and the UK. So. There's no question, but that renewables are, are the, the cheapest source of generation at source. Uh, the question is, how much does it cost to get it from the point of generation through to the end customer? Uh, and the um, the cost of operating the grids, the, the network costs, as they're known, are a big part of the uh, overall uh, end tariff costs to, to the consumer. So, you know, we, we certainly need to look at more distributed renewable generation, uh, both kind of large scale as well as behind the meter. Uh, rooftop solar just makes sense uh, everywhere now, really, and uh, particularly when coupled with uh, battery storage, for, which will maximize self-consumption of that solar for the consumer. Uh, it's a really good way to get low cost, zero carbon energy to the consumer rather than always looking to the grid to do everything in terms of supply. So I think the new business models that are coming in. Um, energy suppliers are innovating really fast, uh, some more so than others, uh, like those that are on the panel here, uh, looking at new products and services for their consumers to help them to uh, decarbonize their supply without, um, uh, without it costing them too much to, to do that. Um, aggregators such as ourselves can work with energy suppliers and we can work with independents uh, 
uh, who can help the consumers who are making the, the transition and adopting the, the, the types of uh, decarbonization assets that we've talked about. Um, we can help them to, to uh, either generate revenue streams by participating in grid flexibility or keeping it um, even more simple, uh, particularly working with energy suppliers, uh, rather than customers having an energy supplier and paying them for imports and then having another way of generating revenue from uh, balancing services, it, it could all be rolled up into one. You could just offer uh, customers discounted uh, tariffs if they agree to participate in flexibility. And I think that's probably the, the simplest way to do it, but I think it'll be quite some time before kind of competition does its thing and figures out uh, the best way for, uh, the best and kind of simplest way for the consumer to benefit from all this. But if they do, and you know we do need consumers to participate, then it will be a win-win-win for everybody, win for the consumer, win for the energy system in terms of efficiency, um, and win for the planet, obviously, in terms of decarbonization. Thank you, Mark. Lima, it would be great to get your perspective on the pay-as-you-go model, how, how that can be a, a win for everyone. Thank you. Um, so I believe, um, you know, pay as you go and, uh, you know, other off-grid solar um, energy uh, sources have been, you know, win-win for, for everybody, including the consumer. Number one, I think uh, the fact that, you know, it eliminates uh, uh, dirty methods of electrification or, or of energy, um, particularly in, uh, in, in urban Urban, sorry, in rural areas has been quite instrumental and, and you know, something that is a, a big uh, um, game changer for the planet in terms of using, uh, you know, renewable solar energy, which is abundant in, you know, many um, uh, emerging markets, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, for, for the energy uh, system providers in particular countries, um, you know, particularly utilities and governments, it's given them an opportunity to meet their policy mandate of, you know, connecting people to to energy and newer sources of energy uh, without necessarily you know, utilizing the national grid, which requires huge uh, investments in terms of uh, infrastructure uh, to implement. And um, as I already mentioned for energy utilities, um, you know, when you pair them with uh, mini grid developers, um, you know, they can partner and develop new uh, tariffs that are win-win for both of them and basically supports uh, the utilities to also increase their revenue. Um, I think another key player um, that I should mention is mobile operators. Um, when you look at uh, most emerging markets, you know, mobile technology covers uh, most of the countries or most of the areas of the country, even areas where, you know, the national electricity grid does not cover. So the pairing of mobile technology and off-grid solar, particularly pay-as-you-go solar, you know, has been quite instrumental in the usage of this technology, particularly mobile payments, um, for the customers to make those micro payments and for, for the, the service providers, you know, to collect their revenue um, remotely using mobile money. And this has also created, you know, um, uh, a new source of revenue or increased source of revenue for mobile operators. Um, uh, basically because uh, paying, you know, using, uh, paying for, for energy, you know, increases the usage of, of mobile money. Um, so I would say that uh, it's, it's been a win-win across the board. Um, of course, not to say the, the, the sector is perfect. Um, I think uh, they're quite uh, big endeavors to place the customer or the consumer in the middle of all this. Um, there is an industry association, which I can talk more about, uh, Gobla, uh, which, you know, promotes um, a consumer inclusion or a protection code that, uh, you know, ensures that the consumer wins um, in the end. So happy to talk more about that as we go along. Thank you, Lima. Kristen, you are seeing a lot of models uh, of how this is evolving in different countries. It will be great to get your perspective on how you see you see this, how we can make sure that this is a win for everyone. Thanks. I, I go back to how I began my 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 talk, um, just about the, the North Star of, of the energy transition. And and I think it's it's always worth looking back at that 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 you know there are competing dimensions. So so when we're 
when we're pushing forward on, on energy security and resilience, we have to be careful that it's not at the expense of an affordable system for, for consumers. We have to really balance that, um, all of these different approaches across security and the sustainability piece, as well as the affordable and just system piece. And so I think that, that having that North Star in mind always is, is really helpful. And, you know, there's definitely a role. I mean, we've heard from several business leaders here with, with excellent business models, and there's an opportunity for a lot of business leadership here, but there's also government leadership is needed to help drive those, those um, business models. And, and I think that, you know, that's where I think we'll, we'll probably get to this later in the conversation, just about the importance of of collaboration, of having um, having co collaboration not just across business and and government, but including civil society and consumer groups, et cetera, so that so that you can take a a much more strategic approach to to the energy transition. Thank you. So. You know, it feels that all, as you say, these are brilliant business models. And the question is what we need to unlock them, what we need to move them into, you know, to sufficient scale uh, to help us with the transition. My question uh, for Marsha and Mark in relation to demand flexibility, what is what need to happen to make sure that we are able to get to that uh, level of uh, engagement for consumers. We have all these business models working well. So what, what are the things that you you think that, you know, what is your wish list to make this happen? Let's start with you, Marcia. Uh, I, love a, I love a good wish list. Um, so I think the whole sector is evolving very, very rapidly and the, one of the, the aspects of this rapid evolution is how you interact with devices. Um, so whether it's cloud to cloud or whether it's via another controlling device, um, all the protocols and the ways of exchanging information and the sort of information that is exchanged, uh, in a sense, needs to become standardized that these devices need to become interoperable uh, so that if I buy a Tesla car, um, I can then say to Mark's uh, company, well, can you operate it? And Tesla shouldn't be able to say no. Or if a consumer says, well, I'd like my heat pump uh, being managed by Mark, but my EV being managed by electricity, that should be possible as well. And at the heart of that possibility is a requirement for devices to be able to talk to each other and for interoperability. Uh, so my one plea would be, we need to move to an interoperable system, uh, but not too quickly because things are still evolving rapidly. So I think there is this expectation of interoperability and a requirement, but exactly how it's going to happen, I think, needs to will need to evolve over time so first thing is interoperability and the second thing is uh we need all the markets to be open for consumer flexibility because that means that the value that consumers can provide can be unlocked uh, and consumers can then be active participants um, and there's huge amount there's a huge amount of complexity in that statement uh, and if you're uh, a system, op a network operator or a, in the control room, it's going to require a significant cultural change. Um, and it's happening. Uh, and one of the things we need to do is put the control room engineers and the distribution network engineers who aren't doing it yet in contact with those who are. And we need to do that very rapidly because the energy transition is happening rapidly. And unless we can get the people who are running electricity markets and electricity systems comfortable, we'll, we won't do a good job. Yeah, that is very clear. And 
Marsha, do you think that these are issues that need to be solved globally in the, in the sense that we need to have, for example, these standards that we need to develop for these to be this, this um, energy devices to be interoperable and therefore consumer have a choice, which is quite important in this. Do you think that this can be developed by jurisdiction or actually there is a need to do this in a, in a global way? And if that is the case, I mean, is that not making it even more difficult to get there, to coordinate all these different, different governments? So uh, I, th I think it's worthwhile looking at things like uh, GSM, and Lima's probably got some better examples here, but this is a, an international standard and you can take your phone and you can use it in New Delhi or you can use it in London or you can use it even in New Zealand, where I'm from. Um, and it didn't happen immediately, uh, but there was a vision and a requirement to move in that direction. Um, and I think the same thing is true with interoperability of energy devices, that you need to have the vision and you need to be clear of where you want to get to. Uh, and then you gradually develop the technical underpinnings for that. And going back to what Christine was saying about leadership of government, do you think that to make that happen, where that, uh, who should be leading that? So again, if you look at standard development, um, I think you, you tend to get groups of manufacturers and suppliers and, and networks working together to develop a, a sort of a de facto standard. And then for a while there is competition globally between different de facto standards. Uh, and part of that competition is about understanding which one delivers the best functionality. So another really good example is Bluetooth, where um, while there's a sort of overarching framework, there's different uh, types of communication standardization between different types of devices and, and different needs. So if you want a really localized communication network, you know, there's one Bluetooth protocol. Uh, if you're dealing with medical devices, there's a different one. Um, and I, this whole question around standardization is going to be key in terms of enabling a, a cost-effective uh, green energy system. Yeah. Mark, I, I'm wondering whether, what is your perspective on this? Do you agree with the wish list? Anything that you want to add to that list? I, I maybe would add something, but I'll, I'll just echo what Marcia said first. Um, we're not going to get there without standardization and uh, interoperability. Uh, in the UK, this, ha this has been recognized by UK government. Um, they sponsored a program to develop a new set of interoperability standards for uh, energy smart appliances um, called the PAS standard, PAS 1878 and 1879. I don't mean to get too technical, but that's the name of the standards. Uh, it's very early stage. Uh, the intention of these is to move on from situation at the moment where aggregators like ourselves have to do a new integration with every new asset that is developed or launched by every uh, by every manufacturer, so you know hundreds of different manufacturers doing hundreds of different types of EV charger or battery system or heat pump, uh, we do need to to standardize that process. It it will take time. I'm, I'm thinking probably five years at least away from uh, a stage where we have uh, those kind of standards in place. We're, we're involved in a program to do the early stage kind of testing and development of those past standards with a, a group of manufacturers that have um that, that are participating in the program so that will certainly help that will cover things like interoperability uh grid stability standards and cyber security which is really important from um uh, both the grid management point of view as well as data protection so uh yeah that would be great to see those coming in over time um i think still probably not going far enough in some ways in terms of getting consumers to engage with the system uh, I think we may need to start looking at things like auto enrollment uh, of these assets and programs. Um, if a consumer installs an EV charger or uh, a heat pump or a battery system, that uh, there is a requirement for that, that asset to be smart connected, to be connected to the cloud, and uh, for that um, asset to be available uh, with the customer's consent to participate in these programs. And I think as long as the benefit gets through to the end consumer in making these devices available uh, to participate in, in grid services, then um, 
that's where we need uh, to get to. Uh, the consumer, you know, always should have the option to opt out of anything that's happening that doesn't fit their needs. So a customer can set preferences in terms of how the device operates. They can always uh, opt out of any um, uh, event or, or grid service uh, delivery event that, that may happen. For example, if, if uh, an aggregator or other energy supplier has asked their EV to stop charging for a certain period during the peak hours, then the customer, if they need it, can always override that. So I think that choice is important. But at the end of the day, the majority of these assets, it doesn't really matter to the consumer if they plug in their EV at 6 p.m., at 6 o'clock in the evening, and it's due to get two or three hours of charge. It doesn't really matter to the consumer when those two or three hours of charge happen until the following morning. So, um, yeah, I think we, we may need to look at, at moving toward kind of auto enrollment over the over the coming years uh, to make it uh, work even more efficiently. Thank you, Mark. It would be good to discuss later about what role do you see in play the consumer protections in that in that respect. How we make sure that consumers trust and then engage with these new business models because they know that everything, you know, they will be protected if something goes wrong. But let's move to Lima. Lima, from your perspective, of pay as you go, solar, and whatever we can take, pay as you go. What do you, will be in your wish list to accelerate that business model? Um, I think, um, you know, the sector has grown fairly strongly over the last, um, uh, you know, couple of years, there are definitely, you know, some markets that are lagging behind um, because of uh, key enabling factors, you know, not quite, uh, you know, being there. Um, you know, some of the enablers, of course, um, as I mentioned, mobile technology, uh, the robustness of that, uh, you know, technology in a country, uh, supportive um, uh, government uh, policies around uh, renewables and, 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 and innovation. And um, I think another very key aspect is, um, you know, also willingness of uh, mobile operators to support, um, for example, integrations of uh, uh, mobile money with solar systems. Um, and of course, a big, a big aspect is funding as well. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, basically has been a need for patient capital, uh, particularly from, you know, donors, um, um, you know, to 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 support um, the growth and catalyzing of uh, those business models in the markets where they uh, uh, don't uh, exist. Um, for 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 developed markets, uh, as far as uh, off grid solar is concerned, you know, there is uh, definitely a lot of uh, product innovation that's still yet to happen. Um, I think a lot of companies will. Uh, be moving away from just uh, you know pay as you go of energy, but pay of go. And I believe, you know, there will also be consolidation of, of the sector from having uh, many different players, uh, but, uh, you know, a number of them coming together um, uh, to, uh, to develop bigger companies. And I think also in terms of, uh, you know, companies being vertically integrated to more specialization in the sector, for example, you know, some just focusing on um, uh, manufacturing, others on software solutions, um, others on distribution. Um, and, 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 and financing as well. Um, uh, there is a lot of movement as well towards uh, pay-as-you-go smartphones, which is another key business model that has been built on top of uh, you know, pay-as-you-go solar. So those are some of the uh, wish lists, and of course, um, continued support by governments to create an enabling environment for, for those innovations to thrive. And Lima, in, in, that, in, in that model of pay as you go solar that can go into other areas, how how we protect consumers for getting too much debt, debt that they cannot really afford? What, what do you think is need to happen to protect consumers in that respect? Um, so, so I think there is a lot to talk about in terms of affordability, um, you know, and, and, and basically affordability for different types of consumers as far as these products are concerned. Um, I would say that most of the companies have different ranges of you know, products that they sell to different customer groups, uh, small systems you know, that cost uh, you know, less, uh, depending on your will willingness to buy, you know, they build other products on top like uh, TVs and things like that. 
So I think having that range um, of choice for consumers is quite 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 key. Um, uh, I, I mentioned briefly about Gogla's uh, industry consumer protection code, which basically ensures that uh, you know companies have endorsed it and have adopted it, and it has different principles, you know, ranging from transparency. Uh, of pricing, um, you know, transparency in terms of uh, product specifications are concerned, ensuring that the consumer has been given the right information before they buy, uh, you know, this product, and also explanation uh, towards, um, uh, you know, the, the the debt level that they're getting themselves into. The contracts are usually up to years in most cases, uh, with uh, flexible payments, um, you know, um, over time. Uh, there are obviously different types of consumers, you know, there are those that are able to, um, to afford, uh, I was going to mention later about a critical, you know, vulnerable. flexibility and the protections uh, for consumers. So um, these business models will result in a lot of data that they will have from uh, consumers that will be gathered by this, uh, by the different players in that, in that system. So do we feel that the, we currently have the right protections to make sure if something goes wrong, that first privacy is protected, and also uh, any data leaks or anything that can put the consumer at risk, uh, you know, we, we have a way to protect consumers. Marsha, Mark, uh, it would be good to get your perspective on that, whether the, the, current, the current regulations that are evolving around the world and we are in different, in different places around the world in relation with, for example, on data, but whether you think that uh, is this uh, what is happening enough, more need to be done to make sure that consumers have the right protections. I don't know who wants to start, whether Marcia or Mark. Um, think about, bo both of you seem to be ready. So let's start with Mark You've now, because Mar I always start with Marcia. So over to you, Mark. Sure. Cool, yeah. Um, I, it's a really important one. I think over the last kind of five, 10 years, uh, businesses have started to understand that consumer data is you know, almost like a physical property. I, you, you really need to ensure that anything you do with the customer data um, is you know you have to handle the, the data extremely carefully, and any breaches can lead to uh, um, you know significant problems. I think in terms of energy data, I, look, we, we we all give away our data all the time when we're browsing the internet, right? We, we we you know flippantly without ever looking at the terms conditions for a lot of things, just click consent, and then we, we give our data away to um, to lots of different businesses who do lots of different things with them. I think energy data. Uh, we're a long way away from that. I think uh, consumers are, are quite protective of their um, of sharing their data, that their their smart meter data, for example. Uh, smart metering is is uh, really uh, you know a, a big thing in the UK now. We're one of the leaders in, in the smart meter rollout uh, as a meter asset provider uh, in the UK. We've installed over four million meter points, um, uh, and you know soon over the next kind of three to four years, we'll see pretty much every home in the UK having having a smart meter. Uh, and that will be a very important part of digitization of the energy system and ensuring that efficiency is there and, and everything. It, customers um, can consent to sharing that smart meter data with any business. Uh, energy suppliers by default, you know, have access to data at certain kind of resolution for billing purposes. Uh, but consumers can share that data with, with uh, other providers that can offer a service to them. And, and we've had a lot of experience in this in the demand flexibility service in the UK, which has been running over the last over the course of this winter, where National Grid, the, the electricity transmission operator, uh, pay consumers to reduce demand for specific times to help protect the grid. Um, we have a, we had a process in place with our clients, uh, um, our partners, uh, for their customers, um, app users, for example, to be able to uh, simply you know, consent to sharing their data uh, for the purpose of participating in that particular service. So they're there's starting to be more established ways for that data to be shared. Um, and I think uh, for consumers, you know, that will be a very important, uh, a very important thing going forward. Um, 
what's the value in sharing their data? Obviously, you know, the, the, the value is in participating in these services where you get paid to participate. Um, but just like any other form of consumer data uh, exchange, you know, the, the appropriate protections need to be need to be there to ensure that uh, the customer is protected first and foremost. So not sure how well that answers the question, but that's my, my take on the new. Yeah, but what is your view about, so yes, we can make it easier for consumers to consent to make an active decision to consent to give their data. But um, I mean, for what we, I'm seeing in other markets, they will be worried, many of them, maybe not everyone, will be worried about what happened with that data? How we make sure that that data is being used for what is, you know, what the provider is telling yeah. me that it's going to be used? And how I can make sure that the provider and this data is, you know, distributed to many players in the system, how we make sure that that data is safe? And if there is a problem with that data, how we make sure that I get redress or I know, you know, I get some kind of, um, I, I know what can happen and can be resolved. So. What is your view on that? Yeah, um, so I think, again, consumers, um, when they participate in programs like the Demand Flexibility Service, they, they take a box to say that uh, they're agreeing to that data being used by that specific third part party for a very specific purpose. Um, we're gathering quite a lot of, of data from tens of thousands of, of uh, smart meter customers across the UK. We can only use it for that very specific purpose and we're very clear uh, that at the end of this service period uh, we will no longer have access to that data for any uh, for any purpose uh, so it's, it's essentially you know, destroyed and, and, and the customer uh, our retention of that data is destroyed obviously that the, the customer still has rights to it the way the smart metering system works in the uk is there is a central repository for all of this data called the data communications uh, company the dcc um, all smart meter data initially goes from the smart meter out to that central uh, register or repository and then is distributed to whichever uh, third party the customer has consented to giving it to so that there's a, a kind of a trusted a trusted central party in the mix there to ensure that um, the data flows and data protection is uh, is as it should be and that system has been working uh, very well for the last uh, uh, over many years since smart reading came along and um, no significant data breaches have, have happened as yet. So um, yeah, I, I think the the UK government and policymakers have gone about it the right way to ensure that these protections have been built in from the start. Of course, we are going to get a whole lot more uh, data on top of smart metering data, which is the boundary meter data. All of these assets are going to be like battery systems, EV charging, heat pumps, they're all going to produce a whole lot more data as well. And we still have to figure out how to get that data from the asset out to where it's supposed to go to the manufacturer for warranty purposes, to an energy supplier or an aggregator for you know, flexibility services. So um, still some work to do, but I think there's a very solid foundation there uh, with the smart metering infrastructure and the DCC entity that's uh, been uh, put in place to handle that. Thank you, Mark. Marsha, what is your view on this? So Mark's already, in a sense, made the really positive point, which is consumers' data is hugely valuable and they have a right to the ownership of that data and they have the right for it to be protected uh, and to grant the information to uh, who they choose. Um, however, there are a couple of other things to think about uh, and it's, it's important to add another dimension. Uh, I'm pretty sure in Estonia, they have, I mean, they've got a fantastic setup where the consumer is able to very easily uh, provide their own information to whoever they wish. Um, but the grid operator who runs the system also has access to that data uh, because that enables them to understand how well their system is running and what needs to happen. So a consumer's data has value for them but there is a public good also with that value. Uh, and, you know, when, when governments and policymakers are thinking about energy systems, they need to be clear about that public good question. Uh, so another example of that is uh, for a distribution electricity network company, understanding uh, 
uh, the assets that are on their system enable them to have a better understanding of what might happen in terms of congestion over time. Uh, so that's one thing. So, so uh, data is hugely important. Consumers should have strong protection around that. We need to remember that there is a public good uh, element to it. And then lastly, we need to be really careful that we don't go too far. Uh, because in a world where innovation is happening, sometimes an approach to security may lock out innovation. And what do I mean? Well, uh, in Germany, the smart meter rollout is around 1%. It's less than 1%. That means it's very hard to do that wonderful matching of consumers' flexibility with the renewable, and it's slowing down the energy transition. And one of the key reasons for this delay is the, uh, the smart meter gateway. So they have these tremendously complex requirements on the smart meter gateway and a tremendous amount of security. So it used to be that the smart meter had to be uh, set up for an individual house before the smart meter left the manufacturer, that it would be put in a locked box, uh, that that could be transported to the customer's premise um, you know, the security around those smart meters were a considerable challenge, as are some of the other processes around um, uh, requiring all communications with consumers' devices to go through that smart meter gateway. Um, because actually, Mark's already talked about his cloud to cloud based system. There are a lot of other approaches and while security is absolutely fundamental and we shouldn't compromise on it, and as an aside, cybersecurity is also pretty essential, and we haven't really touched on this, but there are um, there are a range of non-proprietary systems out there uh, which are incredibly robust, and you know I would I would encourage a non-proprietary approach. Um, we need to make sure that in our zeal for protection we don't destroy the energy transition or we don't slow it down and make it more costly. And it's a really delicate balancing act. Yeah, so how, how you balance that? Because for me as a consumer, I really don't want us unsafe innovation. In particular, if I, I don't know that it's unsafe. So obviously we need to make sure that we don't have too much protection that inhibit innovation, but at the same time, we need to have the right protection. So. From you know, your point of view in this discussion about demand flexibility, do you think that we are in the right path to get that balance right? Do we think that we are, um, you know, the right people are around the table to make sure that that balance uh, is? So that's, that's a global question. And I think it does, I think it varies tremendously, both by country and actually by participant within a country. I think where we need to be, where we need to start is by being clear about what the outcomes are. So consumers' data should not be compromised, they should own it. Um, that uh, um, sort of trust modeling, so understanding who is communicating with you, that that has been done for all the business models that are out there. And that that there is there is oversight of those processes, but we shouldn't. I don't think define a particular system. So you know the the UK does have the DCC, uh, but actually Mark then made a point about the number of devices that are out there. The amount of information that is going to be going through the DCC is more than the DCC will be able to manage. So actually, we need to be thinking about alternative approaches that work with the DCC infrastructure and with uh, appropriate cybersecurity arrangements. Um, and, and I, yeah, I, this is a really complex topic and potentially uh, we have not the time to go into it in detail. Yeah, thank you, Marsha. Um, 
Christine, I'm, I'm coming to you because you, you uh, in your introduction, you talk about the importance uh, of working as a coalition and building, you know, putting the civil society, consumer group, government, the businesses to, in today's debate. Do you think that this is a way to tackle this issue, for example? I do, I, on, on two levels. One, which is really quite practical. I mean, the UK is certainly leading in a lot of these, um, these, these models on the transition. I mean, what, what Marsha and Mark have been talking about today, um, there's, there's just a lot of innovation and really interesting approaches. And, and what I hear from stakeholders around the world often is, I want to understand what is working where and why. And, and so it's these types of, of models that I think it's, it's really interesting to have global exchanges like this, where we hear what's happening and working, and then also have the opportunity to go far more in depth and understand why and what are those policies um, that are supporting it and what are, what are the structural changes? Because I think there's something really big about and practical about these structural changes, the, the, the policies, the, the, the financial instruments, et cetera, that are needed in order to enable the transition. And then the second reason I think is a bit more um, sort of strategic is, is just thinking about value. And I think that there's a, a real opportunity to move the needle by aligning all of these different stakeholders, the, the public, the private, civil society, and and at, at all levels of, of stakeholder from city to, to national level to really think about the outcomes and the value. So I think you can look at a number of different solutions that 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 are possible, but then to look at what is the impact, what's the value it's going to have on the economy, on the environment, on society. So you can actually measure this, like you can look at what's the job creation going to be? What's the cost savings going to be for consumers? How is it going to impact air quality and improve um, human health? I mean, there's so many different factors that you can look at, energy access, how, how many more? So, so I think that by bringing together these different stakeholders from, from different different parts of society you can if you're if you're having these dialogues you can you can really kind of do much more alignment on the outcomes and the value that that provides and that might help shift some of the policy it might help and enable these business models that need to be enabled if everybody's aligned on the outcome and the value so it's a bit lof a, a bit lofty of an idea um, but it's something that we talk about quite often here at the forum using a framework which we call system value, just about aligning all of these different stakeholders around you know, the impact and the value that it provides to society. So Kristen, how we make sure that this happened? How, you know, we, we, you, you articulate the importance of focus on the value on the outcomes that we are trying to achieve and you say there are many, um, but how we bring everyone together? What do you think that need to happen to get more of these conversations going to get us where we need to be? Well, look, I, I think that this is this is the purpose of many organizations, such as the World Economic Forum, such as Consumers International, to bring, you know, I sometimes say unlikely stakeholders together and, and to talk about these challenges. And I think that certainly there is a really important role for dialogue, but there's equally an important role of, you know, using that dialogue to really get to action, right? So it is it is this combination of having that dialogue, having that alignment and that that broader understanding about where, where we wanna go, whether you're in a specific market or whether it's a global dialogue, and then really having practical exchanges about, models that work, policies that work. Thank you, Kristen. Um, well, it have been a fascinating discussion. We are almost out of time. I have been, um, as we, you know, I think it was Marsha, Kristen, 
said there is a lot in many of these topics, and probably we need several discussions on different on the different issues to uh, to really go, get deep into this. But it's quite clear from my perspective what I'm hearing uh, the size of the opportunity is huge, and I'm I'm not sure it's optional. It really feels as a necessity for us to get to the uh, to the uh, net zero and also doing it in a in a in a way that is affordable. Um, but there are a lot of still challenges that need to be uh, need to be addressed, and I think that what you said, Christine, the importance of bringing the right stakeholder and having this conversation is key. And from that perspective, it's brilliant that Consumer International have organized this conference because it's part of that it's part of that uh, that solution. So um, thank you very much. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say. To finalize is that, as you know, this is the second day of the uh, Clean Energy Conference. There are uh, more discussions uh, during the week. And here we have a slide that tells you what is happening uh, the next day. So on Wednesday, we have our consumer vision for clean and affordable energy. You have all the different times. Then on Thursday, we are uh, discussing grassroots solutions for energy access and how we can leverage the power of consumers. So I think I'm going into more detail in some of these discussions that we have had. And on Friday we have, is consumer policy fit for the clean energy, which is again, some of the topics that we have uh, touched uh, today. So I hope that you can join us on the rest of the, of the conference. And thank you very much to the panelists. I mean, huge expertise and you have been quite, um, you know, quite clear and um, excellent in the way that you have articulated all these issues. So thank you very much. And thank you all of you who have joined us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.